This is Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to the podcast. Chris Graham, we're joined by Scott German, and we're going to do something different on this podcast. You know, normally we'll talk about something specific, either a game just played or a game coming up. And there is a game coming up this weekend at Wake Forest. And go to AugustaFreePress.com, depending on when you're listening to this podcast, obviously, uh, if you're listening to it down the road. But uh, if you're listening to it uh, Friday, Saturday, we'll, I'll have a game preview of the UVA Wake Forest game coming up. But we thought we'd do something special. Uh, you know, these are um, these are some interesting times in UVA basketball fandom days. Uh, and, uh, you know, Scott and I, Scott predating me, obviously, by at least a few years. Uh, but we all remember. Be gentle. Uh, be gentle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm saying pretty by a few years. You know, uh, I remember the good years. Uh, I was a, a second grader when Ralph Sampson was a first year at UVA, and uh, a, one of the reasons I ended up e- even wanted to go to school at UVA Scott was because Ralph Sampson was a basketball player there, and I you know got the name in the it just ingrained in me. And but uh, y- you know those years compared to these years, you know, and I'll say this, Scott, and I'm going to talk a little bit, and then of course we'll both. Ch- uh, chat about this topic of of you know the, the the new glory days of UVA basketball. I guess you can say the the new good old days. Um, you know when I was writing the book, co-writing the book with Patrick Height, uh, Mad About You: Four Decades of Basketball at University Hall. It was in 2006, and that was at a time. I mean, you know, Virginia basketball was 20 years plus past the Ralph era. Really, 10 years plus past. The, really, the good Jeff Jones years, you know, we were towards the end of, in fact, the, the Pete Gillen era had come and gone. We were in year two of Dave Lado. He was about to be fired. Uh, Tony Bennett was somebody we'd never even heard of before, much less had any idea that what was to come with him. And, um, you know, in 2006, writing that book, uh, when we wrote about the Ralph years, I, and I, I can still remember this feeling. I was writing about something that had happened. And probably in my mind at that time would never happen again. You know, it was just something like, hey, for for four years we were the center of the college basketball world and weren't those great days and shame on us that we let it slip away. And here we are, Scott, 2018, number two team in the country. That's the second time in three years we've seen that team ranked that high. Still haven't been number one since the Ralph era, but it could happen any time. And, uh... You know, it's different now, though, right? I mean, it's a different feeling now uh, as it was in the Ralph years because well, – I won't let you get into this. Very different. Uh, from, from As we said, I, I was part of that era with Ralph having the fort- – being fortunate enough to cover the team, working for the News Virginian and getting assignments that a lot of people would cover because the dear editor, Jim Gordon, the – Legendary Jim Gordon would be too busy entering bowling scores uh, to to attend a UVA North Carolina basketball game. So I often got uh, the old blind pig finds an acorn theory. I got to cover a lot of those games and covered a lot of them on the road. But there was, you know, we had a great team, but there was always that that feeling of impending doom or the clock striking midnight on Cinderella because every year we had to wonder, is this the year that Ralph finally caves in to the Red Sox and, or to the risk of the Celtics and Red Arbach and goes to the NBA and leaves the university and we return to relative mediocrity again? Every year you had that sense. So you kind of wanted to revel in every aspect of what, what Virginia was going through at the time, the lofty ratings, the, the uh, marquee matchups on CBS with the Dick Enbergs and the Al McGuire's routinely coming to Charlottesville. But you always had in the back of your mind that wasn't going to last because we all knew that once the big guy left campus, we were going to go back into that fishbowl again with all the other little fish. But now it's completely different because Tony has built a program here that's sustainable, interchangeable. Um, we've witnessed it with Brogdon, with Toby Gill leaving, and other players coming in assuming those roles. Uh, this darn thing 
thing is built for the long run. So these, uh, these are, uh, uh, quoting a Carly Simon song, these are the good old days. And they don't look like they're going to come to end anytime soon, Chris. Yeah, and I think it'd be good for, especially for the, I don't want to say newer fans because you know there's a I mean there's a new generation of 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 people who who love UVA sports have always loved UVA sports but they're younger than we are, you know they may not remember Ralph Sampson even to them might be like a you know sort of a uh, you know distant memory or not even a memory maybe just something they've heard of in the past, and you know to to put into context Ralph I mean to, uh, uh, Terry Holland was the coach uh, that uh, that that brought. The, the winning tradition to UVA. Before before Terry Holland, there was no winning tradition. Barry Parkhill made a shot against South Carolina. I think it was a 71-72 season. And that was one season Virginia basketball had in, in about 30 or 40 years that was anything decent. But even that was fleeting. Um, Terry Holland takes over in 74 by 76. A, a, a team with a losing record wins the ACC tournament, goes to the NCAA tournament. Back when the NCAA tournament was nothing like it is now. But still, there was you know, the next year in '77. That team had some injuries. They once again got to the final of the ACC tournament, lost. I think it was an overtime to North Carolina. But Ralph Sampson matriculates. You know, co- comes out of nowhere. Uh, he was looking at Kentucky, North Carolina, anywhere else but Virginia. But he goes to Virginia. You know, not too far from his home base in Harrisonburg. And even with Ralph, the first year Virginia was ranked in the top 20 most of that that freshman season, 1979-1980. But the NCAA tournament, again, still wasn't what it is now with 68 teams. Still about 40 teams in the tournament then. And so though, though Virginia was ranked in the top 20 most of that season, they didn't get an NCAA bid, and, and with the great Ralph Sampson, had to play uh, in the NIT and won the NIT. <clears throat> Start the next season ranked top five preseason in the country <clears throat> and spent much of, the, much of the next three years, well, the entirety of the next three years, ranked in the top ten in the country, most of that time top five, and I counted this up the other day, Scott, 12 weeks at number one in the country. The last week we were ranked number one in the Ralph era was the week of December 21st, 1982. Uh, after a, a loss that week, uh, Virginia uh, spent much of the rest of that season at number two in the country. Of course, they only made the one Final Four during the Ralph era, made one Final Four after. But, you know, there was that period of time where it, Virginia was sort of – Virginia basketball was the nouveau riche – uh, you know, to use that economic term, you know, we were the lottery winners. We, you know, we went from nowhere, uh, being poor people with an outhouse, to having, uh, you know, basically living in a country club for four years with Ralph Sampson, uh, and then the Terry Holland years. I mean, after after Ralph, I mean, you know, Terry got Virginia back to Sweet Sixteens. There was an Elite Eight uh, in 1989. Um, uh, he he retires early because of health issues. Jeff Jones, his one of his assistants, former player, actually a player during the Ralph years, takes over. Uh, Jeff wins an NIT title. He goes to four NCAA tournaments. Uh, he has Virginia ranked. He had, actually takes him to an Elite Eight. Should have been a Final Four in 1995. And then there was a long period of time between 1995 and about 2000. I think it was 2012. That Virginia didn't win an NCAA tournament game. Actually, no, they they did. They won one in 2000, 2007 season. Won one NCAA tournament game for a 17-year period. Um, and those of us like Scott, like me, um, who th- who remembered the Ralph years, remembered the Terry Holland years, remembered those good Jeff Jones years, we thought this will never come back. I mean, we we had our chance with Ralph. Didn't win anything with Ralph. We didn't win anything after Ralph. It didn't translate into better recruiting after Ralph. And it's over. I mean, you know, it was nice that we were there, but it'll never come back. And then in 2013-2014, that team wins an ACC tournament. They go to the Sweet 16. We've been to an Elite Eight since. We're ranked number two in the country now. And, you know, I, I agree with you, Scott. It's, it, the, the, the difference this time is back in the Ralph years, you had a supremely talented player who probably, you know, you get a guy like that now, he plays one year for it, and he's gone to the NBA. But Tony Bennett... We, you know, we the the teams that won in 2013, 2014, 2015, those were Malcolm Brogdon, Justin Anderson, Joe Harris, London Parentes. Those guys are gone. This year's team ranked number two in the country, and it's because it's not about a player. It's about a coach and a system, and boy, yeah, these are the good days because, because you know, as long as Tony Bennett's around, there's no reason that that can't repeat, and that's what, you know, that's what has – People like us, giddy, is that you know you know that it's 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 something that's sustainable, 
And, uh, you know, and plus, I guess there, maybe there's that aspect, Scott, of we've been there before, we lost it for a long time, now we got it back, and we ain't giving it up anymore. I mean, th- th- we've got it. We're going we're gonna to cling to it now, right? Well, we hope so. Um, you know, you talked about those dark ages, uh, 95, from not, uh, let's just say 95 to 2012. Um, they were truly dark ages because before, then we, we go back to before, um, before Ralph and back even before Terry, I, I, as a youngster, as a real young, real little youngster, going with my father to see Bill Gibson coach teams that, that Barry Parkhill played in, uh, played on. Um, you know, with the exception of a couple of years, um, that that Barry had sensational all ACC type performances. Um, you know, we that's all Virginia basketball knew was the dark ages. There wasn't even uh, uh, any periods of success. So, um, you know, we had a couple of years with Park Hill, had some had some lean years, but then Samson comes along and we have those glory years that we reached number one, went to two Final Fours, won an NIT championship against Minnesota in Madison Square Garden, of which uh, of which I was actually there for that game and, and watched Ralph and Mc, uh, Kevin McHale battle one another. Um but and then and then along comes ninety five to two thousand twelve. So us basketball fans that go back that far really knew that these were the dark ages because we had seen we, we had witnessed the rise of Virginia basketball all the way to number one in the nation. And then not only see us drop off plummet to just mediocrity, but to take a look around the landscape of college basketball and to look at the Dukes and the Kentucky that were bringing in these one and done, knowing that that's not going to happen at Virginia, then it was truly, to me, it was kind of disheartening because you just kind of felt like here we are uh, going to a gunfight uh, with a with a water pistol in our hand. You know, we're not going to be able to reach those levels again because we're not going to recruit one and done like Duke, Kentucky, Carolina, I guess, would do it if they, they haven't been, but they certainly would not turn one away. Uh, so those were dark ages because there wasn't any light at the end of the tunnel uh, until until Tony Bennett came on the scene. And, and Chris, I'm, again, I want to date myself. I knew all about Tony Bennett before Tony Bennett ever came to Charlottesville. Uh, but unfortunately, it was the Tony Bennett that had many number one hit songs. <laughs> uh, I didn't know anything about the Tony Bennett that was a basketball coach in the upper northwest part of the United States. I don't think anybody other than outside of a few close people that may have been in on that inner circle of, of that search group that brought this this wonderful coach to, to Charlottesville. Um, so, you know, we didn't know that there was no hope of any any return to the glory years, at least not for me. Oh, no, no hope of return to glory years. I mean, even when Tony Bennett was hired, you know, the, the talk after – Dave Lato was fired after his fourth season, you know, a, a terrible season. Virginia lost that year to Liberty at home. They lost in the first round of the ACC tournament to Boston College. Uh, he had won one in – There was a, uh, a journalist that we both know pretty well that might have even been calling for his head. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're probably – yeah, you know, we, we Scott and I – Scott and I spent a lot of time uh, bef- the season before that uh, watching a tournament called the CBI that uh, we'll, we'll, Scott and I will still reference when we go to JPJ when we're sitting there waiting for a game to start, uh, especially a game like, you know, a couple weeks ago, North Carolina defending national champion comes to town. Uh, we'll, we'll remind ourselves that, you know, now we're watching Virginia beat the defending national champion. It hadn't been that long since we saw the CBI played here. Um and Liberty go crazy on Virginia, you know, just those those lean, lean years that we had. Um, but when Tony Bennett was hired, Scott, you remember this, I'm sure, the, the, the message boards had reacted negatively to Tony Bennett because everybody wanted Tubby Smith to be the coach. Tubby Smith, the former Kentucky coach, won a national title at Kentucky. Uh, he's been to, I think he's had two or three jobs since, uh, since he uh, uh, was up for that Virginia, at least in the public mind, was up for the Virginia job. And even Tony's first two seasons didn't inspire a lot. In fact, after two seasons, he was 31-31 and 31 at Virginia. Uh, no postseason to, to show for. And, in fact, his second season ended with that 
that demoralizing loss to Miami in the ACC tournament. Virginia was up 10 with 40 seconds to go and lost the game. Uh, and so, you know, you're 31 and 31 after two seasons. Uh, I'll, there were a number of kids who were, uh, you know, that he recruited who left after one season because I guess they didn't want to have to play the pack line defense. I don't know what the dis- what the deal was with that. Maybe at some point we'll have to ask Tony that question and, you know, get his recollections of, you know, the, the issues those first two seasons. But by year three, he had Virginia back in an NCAA tournament. Year four, they kind of got shafted out of a bid. They, they should have had a bid that year, but, but ended up going to the NIT. Uh, and then year five is when it all turned around. After that loss to Tennessee uh, in late December of that year that, that dropped Virginia to 9-4, and four, they reeled off, uh, what was it, there was a 12-game 12 win- 12 ACC winning streak, uh, ACC regular season championship, ACC tournament championship, Sweet 16 appearance, that I think a lot of us still say if Anthony Gill doesn't sprain his ankle in the second half of that game with Michigan State, that Virginia team goes to a Final Four. A couple years later, you know, that, that meltdown happens in, in the last stages of the game against Syracuse in the Elite Eight. That team may be a Final Four team. Then you got this year's team that's number two in the country after not being ranked preseason. I mean, yeah, these are the good years, but but nobody foresaw even when Tony was there, even a couple years in, that what we would be ex- uh, experiencing now would be what we're experiencing now. So, uh, uh, yeah, it, these the, these are these are you know th- maybe at first that first that 2013 2014 year, Scott. I want to get your impression on this. That first year, I still think you know when when watching that long winning streak, watching all those wins, you and I sat side by side at the ACC tournament final, uh, watching Virginia beat Duke, first ACC tournament championship for the program in 38 years at that point. Um, I'm still thinking, all right. We won the lottery again. Let's see what happens, but better enjoy it while we got it. You know, and here we are. This is five years later now, and, you know, it's it's now clear what wasn't clear even then, which is this is this is here to stay. I mean, at least for the foreseeable future. This is built, and it's here to stay. And um, I don't know. I, 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 still, I still remember those feelings of, you know, do we deserve this or not? And now I think we deserve it. I don't know. What, get, get your thoughts on that. Well, I don't want to get too fundamentally deep, but I remember sitting at courtside of the Duke game in the ACC tournament championship at Greensboro, and, and the 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 euphoria that was surrounded us as as not only writers but as fans of the team, the program. You know, I, I really I don't want to say I had some you know infinite wisdom, but I really believe bought into the system at that point. And, and I thought at that point that this was going to be something that was going to be sustainable. And I've often wondered why I believe that, because I'm not always the easiest person to convince that if, it, if, it's, if it's nice and shiny, it's not always gold. Uh, but, um, you know, I think I, I look back to, to when Coach Bennett decided to come east, never recruited on the east coast, had recruited in, a, in the relative obscurity of the Pac-10 or Pac-12, whatever it was there in Washington State. Mm-hmm. Not not a, not a basketball powerhouse by any means. Uh, what 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 brought him to other than the, the lore of maybe coaching at a level of the ACC, but. Um, what maybe went through his mind and, and, and you know, now that we've gotten to know Tony uh, and know what the character, what character he is, um, I really believe that, that Tony is one of these few individuals that's just a natural born leader that can, that can get people to buy into his beliefs, into his system, because uh, that's what it takes. And if you look at this team, the chemistry that they play with, chemistry that all the teams have played with, uh, maybe back to the, the championship round of 12, um, you know, Tony doesn't get the most talented players, but he gets players that are very coachable, and he gets players that, that I believe that he can look into their eyes, look into their parents' eyes, and get a sense of, this is the kind of, this is the kind of young man I want here. Not always right, you know, and we've witnessed that because they come and go pretty quick, or at least they did. A lot of transfers. Uh, 
So I, I really believe that it all boils down to that we've got a special coach here that is uh, truly a leader of men that can get them, that can get these young kids, 19, 18, 19, 20 year olds to, to buy into the system, to believe in the, the, the pillars of the program as he, as he's laid out. And, uh, and, and they play with that. They play with that each and every game. They may lose Sunday night in Wake Forest, but you know what? It's just going to be a bump. It's just going to be a hurdle if they can get over. It's not going to be the end of the season. Uh, this this program under Coach Bennett, I really believe, is is built for a long, successful run in, in college basketball. And, you know, I wonder how much of this, and obviously, you know, it, I think it has a lot to do how much of this comes from his dad, Dick Bennett? Uh, you know, we, we know that Dick Bennett coached at Washington State uh, briefly before Tony took over, but also, of course, Wisconsin took him to a Final Four. But before he got to the Division One level, Dick Bennett was a Division Three coach for 20-plus years. And, um, you know, I look at, I think about Tony, and I think, you know, he's the kind of guy, I mean, obviously, great success in the ACC. He's, he's you know, arguably right now the – uh, you know his his teams have it's not even in, it's inarguable right now that they're the the most successful team at least in conference of the last five years. We talked about that on our podcast last night, both overall and on the road. But you know he's the kind of guy that he you can see those Division three roots in him because what what Tony Bennett's system, which he inherited and has modified from his father Dick, you know the 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 defense, the pack line, the offense, the mover blocker. These are systems that you just don't walk in as a as a true freshman, as a phenom from the you know from McDonald's All Star game or whatever else, and you pick it up right away and you're a star from the second you get on the court, the first practice in October, you know it takes a couple years at least to learn the system, and so it, it requires patience and it also requires smart kids. I mean, again, you're not just rolling the ball out there and saying, "Hey, kid, uh, bounce the ball until you get to the basket and then dunk it." Or hey, kid, uh, you know, play a two-three zone defense. Uh, you know, you're requiring. I mean, the defense is is intricate. The offense is even more intricate, and it it fits perfectly at a place like Virginia. But it would also obviously fit perfectly and did for 20 plus years. It's why Dick Bennett got to be the coach at Wisconsin because he had such success in the, at the D3 level at smaller schools in Wisconsin, where you know kids don't go play D3 ball for one year. They have to play four years of D3 ball, uh, and so you know. It, it, that's that's what I see there, and, and and one thing we forget about Tony now, he has that pedigree. His dad was a small college coach, a, a D three college coach for a long, long time. Uh, developed that the, the the pack line defensive system. Used to sell VHS tapes out of the back of his car, where he he was teaching the pack line back in the eighties. That's how he supplemented his income as a D three coach. So. You know, he, he's got that humble root. I mean, and of course, one of the pillars, the number one pillar of his, his system is the humility. But we can't forget that Tony Bennett, you know, you see that guy on the sidelines. He's he's not very tall. He's, what, 5'11". Uh, he played in the NBA for three years. You know, he, was, he, he still is and probably always will be the NCAA career leader in three-point percentage. He made almost 50% of his three-point shots over a four-year career at Wisconsin Green Bay. So... You know, from a guy who has the roots of of his dad at the D3 level, the teaching level, he's also a guy that uh, used that himself to elevate from being a 5'11 white guy from Wisconsin to play in the NBA for three years. And honestly, he, he didn't play for only three years because he didn't have the talent. He blew his knee out. He would have had a long, much longer career uh, if not for that injury year, in, in, three years into his career. So... You know, I mean, he's got bona fides on both sides. I mean, he, he's got the D3 coaching line, but he also can say, hey, this system got me in the NBA. What do you think it's going to do for you? And so, you know, that's and, – and he's at Virginia, such a unique place where this can work. I mean, you know, would this work at, at North Carolina? Would this work at Kentucky? I don't think so. It works at Virginia because it just fits so perfectly into the Virginia family, the Virginia culture, um, that, you know, Virginia – I mean, you know, I want to give credit to the people who hired him uh, back in 2010, but I think we also kind of, kind of got lucky that, you know, we got this guy with this background, with this system, to be the coach here because there's there's no more perfect fit between coach and, and university than there is with Tony Bennett and UVA. Well, I agree. Now, I'm not sure I would say that we got lucky because I know that, that um, 
from from what I understand that the due diligence was paid in 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 in, in hiring Tony and obviously the day later it uh <laughs> Era did not come to a sudden ending. I mean, we knew the handwriting was on the wall, maybe as early as the season before. So I'm 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 confident that there were a group of individuals that were um, uh, entrusted to go out and kind of look around the country and and maybe narrow that pool down a little bit as to coaching candidates. And um, you know they. At, at a place, at a school like Virginia, you need a system because it, knowing that the, that the university is not going to be recruiting one and done type players, um, you need a you need a sustainable system. And I think I think a lot of a lot of homework, a lot of research was done. And when Leda was released at the end of that uh, this uh, season, I'm not sure what, when did Tony come? Two thousand and six. 2010. 10. 2010. 10. Um, so, you know, I, I'm 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 pretty confident that there has been a lot of research done on on Tony Bennett. They just didn't say, "Hey, here's a coach that might work here." I'm, uh, knowing his, he, if there was ever a coach that had a pedigree, it was to, a young coach, a, a young coach. Kind of ironic that he was so young that he could have already had a pedigree, but. But it was it was Tony Bennett, and that's not to say he he couldn't he may have not worked out here because early on you know the the handwriting was not clear as to what the, what way it was going to go with Tony. But uh, you know he certainly brought a system here that we know works because the parts have been interchangeable now for the last four or five years, and as we alluded to last night. Uh, UVA has the best winning percentage in ACC play by a long shot, by about nine games over over the next uh, winningest team, North Carolina. Now, you know, you, I guess critics might say, yeah, but since he's been there, he's not won a national championship. Meanwhile, Duke's won one, Carolina's won one. Um, so that's is that the next step to measure success, to measure his the pinnacle here? I'm not sure. If that if I agree with that, but uh, I guess there are going to be some that say that he hasn't reached that pinnacle until he reaches, until he wins a national championship. Well, let, let me. Uh, I'm going to take this back just a second. Uh, I had it wrong. It's 2009 he was hired, and so I'm going to I want to counter you on one thing. He was hired in 2009. I had it I had it backwards in my head, but now I've got it accurate because I was able to do some research real quick. Um, he was hired in 2009. Mike London was hired in 2010. Same people hired both guys. So I will I will throw out again. Sometimes luck's involved too because this. I mean, you know, I know that there was a search committee in basketball, and I'm sure there was a different search committee in football. But ultimately, Craig Littlepage had to sign off on both of these, and they got everything wrong. We all know, and we uh, some of us, me, I'll raise my hand and say some of us knew from day one that Mike London was the wrong guy, and. Now, the, the knock at the time on Tony Bennett was he'd only been a head coach for two seasons. He'd been a head coach, well, actually three seasons, at, at Washington State. Uh, his first team went to the NIT. His second team, he won National Coach of the Year. He took that team to, the I think, the Sweet 16. Third team went to the NIT. So, you know, he was a young guy with not a lot of coaching record. His father had a great coaching career. Uh, he, he was a disciple of his father, coaching-wise. Um, and... Uh, Mike London had a similar uh, light background. He don't. Mike London had only been a head coach for two seasons at Richmond. So, you know, I mean, you know, you roll. I think that both were rolls of the dice a little bit. Um, one worked out. Gr- one has worked out great, and will continue to work out great. One didn't work out at all. So, um, now to your other point, I was going to look up real quick because I, I, every time I think about what you said there, Scott, as far as what you'll hear critics say. Hey, you know, Mike Krzyzewski won a title in the last few years, and Carolina's won a title in the last few years. Uh, Tony hasn't won one, so what about Tony? I think of Dean Smith. And Dean Smith and his coaching record. Dean Smith didn't win a championship until that 82 team uh, that Michael, you know, we all remember Michael Jordan making that shot. Dean Smith took over as the coach at Carolina in 1961. 
So he had been coaching there for, yeah, it was 1981-82. So that was his 22nd season at North Carolina. Now, Dean Smith, by 1982, had been an NCAA runner-up. He'd been uh, NCAA Final Four. I'm just kind of looking at a, a list of their seasons. I mean, Dean Smith, by 1982, was a, a already a Hall of Fame college coach. He didn't need that. I mean, you know, winning the championship certainly was something that added a feather into the cap, but – uh, and I'm not saying that Tony Bennett yet is what Dean Smith was by 1982, but you know, um, I, I don't. I I, I I think that's unfair. I guess I, I, without being able to put it more eloquently, it's unfair for when those critics do say that, hey, he hasn't won a championship, so he's not a great coach. Well, again, I'll throw. I'll throw. I mean, and, and, until Mike Shashevsky won a title, I think that was 1990. You know, he he was a pretty good coach at that stage too. So Tony's got Tony's a young guy. He's not even 50 years old yet. Uh, he's got at least 20, year, 20 more years at Virginia, we hope, uh, uh, to, to, to get through this glass ceiling. But he's already in a conference with Hall of Fame coaches all over the place. Without the championships, it's still his conference because he's, he's, he's the one who sets the standard right now. And uh, I don't know. That's, that's kind of where I go with that. Yeah, I, I didn't say those critics were 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 you know justified in having those because I think that's ludicrous to be honest. He's been there eight years and took over a program that was in shambles. So, uh, and he's also in a in a climate now in college basketball like we've never seen with the one and done. It's hard to it's hard to strategize against how you recruit uh, against the Carolinas and the Dukes now. So he's. You know, it's a lot. It's a tremendous challenge there for him. He got. He will win a national championship. You know, if he stays long enough. Uh, you're right. He, he he was in Carolina for 20 years. Uh, I'm not sure how long Shashevsky was at Duke before he won a championship, but um, I guess you can look that up. I'm not. I'm that, uh, not thinking it was that long. It's probably more like eight or nine. Yeah, I'll look but, it up uh, right now. Yeah, Tony, Tony will get it done. Um, you know, I'm going going back to the so counterpoint to your to your uh, discussion of Lucky. Here, here's how. Here's why I don't. I guess we're both, as one of my friends pointed out to me the other day in an email. Well, we're both. You're entitled to your opinion. Here's how I just. Here's how I classify Lucky. If you go to Vegas and pull the slot machine down and you win twenty thousand dollars, that's pure luck. That has nothing to do with how you studied the machines or probability. That's just random luck. And I don't see uh, any <laughs> luck involved in hiring Tony Bennett. I think it was due diligence. Someone knew that he had a pedigree, that he had a uh, a background that 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 Virginia was going to need to build a foundation that was sustainable. And by gosh, she was going to need to have intelligent players. They knew the climate of the university. They knew the type of players that were going to come here. They put all those pieces together, and there it was. There was a picture of Tony Bennett. I, I choose to believe that's what happened, and that's why he's here. I'll, I'll throw out uh... – I guess luck, maybe, maybe fortunate that – might be a better word than luck. I, I won't. I, I I won't say and didn't say um, pure luck, like pulling a, pulling down the slot and winning twenty thousand dollars. But I'll go back to the same guys that hired uh, Tony Bennett in two thousand nine, hired Mike London in two thousand ten, and they had the same same or very similar qualifications. You know, and and none of us talk. Neither of us talking, or and I'm sure very few of any people listening to this would say that Mike London worked out, but when Mike London was hired in 2010, I mean, he, he was a, he was a head coach for two years, had won a national championship at the 1AA level. He'd been an assistant coach at Virginia. He was recruiting coordinator at Virginia. He'd coach in NFL. You know, so, I mean, you know, I, I think the qualifications of London and and Bennett were so, were so similar going into those jobs that, and the fact that London did not work out at all, and we knew pretty quickly it didn't work out, but we stayed with him for a few years too long, and then Bennett did work out. I mean, there's a 
there, I think in, in any time you hire a new coach, too, there's there's a bit of fortune. I mean, you know, I think Pete Gillen, and when we interviewed Pete Gillen for the book, uh, Mad About You, you know, now 12 years ago, Pete Gillen made a lot of excuses uh, about his tenure, but you know what? I don't know that I terribly disagree with him in some cases. He recruited Majestic Map. Uh, f- folks who remember Majestic Map, he was a McDonald's All-American who got hurt his freshman year and never turned into the player we thought he would, you know, and that's, that's just what happened. Um, you know, if, if majestic map in, in that recruiting class, same recruiting class had Travis Watson and had, uh, they already had uh, Chris Williams and Adam Hall on, on, on grounds, you know, you add a McDonald's all American point guard to that group and they would have won some games. And if they won, if they had won some games, you know, that more recruiting comes in. I mean, you know, sometimes bad things happen and, uh, you know, history gets derailed um, let me let me throw in now. I'll, I'll change gears. I, I had enough time to research Scott while you were talking about Coach K. Interesting. I you know I didn't know this. It was it was his eleventh season at Duke. He'd been a coach at Army for five years before that, so it was his sixteenth year before Coach K won his first national title. We don't remember that because we now all, all think of Coach K as being the legendary Coach K. Sixteen years as a head coach before he won his first title. So. You know, these things aren't as easy as they look. Coach Bennett, this is his ninth year at Virginia. He had three years at Washington State. He's 12 years into his career. Um, you know, he's he's if he wins something this year, wins it in the next couple of years, he's beat Coach K and Coach Smith to the best of all time. So, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I think that I think that is relevant uh, to, to throw in there that and, and that Coach Bennett is still as young as he is. I'm sorry, Chris. Yeah, I'll, I'll say getting back to the. The, the London hiring and the, and the Bennett hire, I will tell you a little story that I cannot say that is 100% fact, but I believe it to be, uh, just by the sources that were that had told it to me, that when it was obvious that the Lato uh, era was going to end in a, in, in a complete disaster, uh, some of the benefactors that were going to help pay to get Lato out and help lure a new coach in, went to little pay, uh, Craig, the AD, and said, we're, we're going to get together some of the more illustrious people that are still very tied to the University of Virginia basketball, and they're going to put together a little informal search committee, and they're going to go out and look for some people that they think will do a good job. Uh, and from what I've been told, that, that committee – consisted of players like Barry Parkhill, Wally Walker, who at the time was in Seattle as the general manager of the Seattle, the now defunct, well, now the Oklahoma City Thunder, the Seattle Supersonics, um, Brian Stiff, uh, Buzzy Wilkerson, some, some heavy hitters, the Mount Rushmore of UVA basketball. Um, also that they hired the new coach, but they certainly bought some candidates to Little Page for approval or review. I don't believe any such search group existed when Anthony, when uh, John Oliver or Craig Little Page went down to Richmond and said, you want a national championship at a 1AA team with other coaches, players, you're going to be our next coach. I think that was all that consisted of that search committee. Well, and, and and we yeah we from what we know publicly at least that is what uh, consisted of that. But again, from a pedigree standpoint, I mean Tony to argue the other side of, of Tony Bennett, he won with another guy's players too. Now they were his dad's players, but at Washington State he had his one good year of the three he was there. You know it was it was holdovers from his dad's staff. So there were similar pedigrees. One worked out, one flamed out, um, and I, you know there there were certainly folks at UVA four years into Tony Bennett uh, after that team that beat Duke. Remember that, that that thrilling win over Duke late in the season at home, the one where Coach K complained about f- fans storming the court. Uh, Joe Harris had 36 points in that game. Virginia wins that game. We all thought that t- that win cemented an NCAA bid. They ended up getting an NIT bid. Uh, we lost to Iowa, I think, in the – what would have been the quarterfinal round of the NIT after winning a couple games early, lost to Iowa at home in the quarterfinal round. I mean, there were some people who still thought, well, this Tony Bennett thing, I mean, we've four years in, we've got one NCAA tournament loss, a 25-point loss to Florida. Uh, we've got an NIT. we got two 500 seasons. 
you know, what, how's this working out for you? Um, and so, you know, and, and of course that was in, that would have been 2012. Mike London had already been to a peach bowl. I mean, you know, he was all, he was ACC coach the year one year. I mean, you know, things work out the way they do. And obviously, I mean, obviously Tony with, with, with Tony's system, you need longevity. You need recruits to stay around, to learn the system, both offensively, defensively, the older they are, the more veteran they are. And it's a system that repeat, that's why it repeats itself. But it took until that fifth year for that to really sink in, not just for the fans, but more importantly for the program. I mean, the, the program had to mature. Um, so, um, it's matured now, and the, the 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 thing about it is now. I mean, you know, and, and he's even had uh, you know the change in in some of his assistants. You know, obviously Richie McKay was a very important. That was that was Tony's first hire uh, as an assistant coach. He, he lured Richie McKay away from Liberty. Richie was a was a head coach at Liberty. He he lured him away from a head coaching job to be the assistant coach. Because that was one of the pillars of his program, and 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 then Richie leaves a couple of years ago to go back to Liberty to take over as head coach, and uh, he replaces him with Brad Soderberg. Now it's a guy that you know Brad Soderberg had coached on Dick Bennett's staff at Wisconsin, so he was someone who the Bennett's were familiar with, very comfortable with, and who also was very comfortable within that system. You know the mover blocker offense, the pack line defense, but you know sometimes you change an assistant coach. You know I, I remember back Scott, you might remember. When uh, Pete Gillen's uh, uh, le- uh, his lead recruiter was a guy named oh, what was his last his last name was Gonzalez, he ends up taking a job at Manhattan, and when Pete lost that guy who was his head recruiter, all of a sudden the recruits stopped coming in. Um, sometimes, sometimes you lose a guy like that. You know, uh, Terry Holland lost Dave Odom late in his run at UVA. I mean, sometimes you lose that key guy on your staff, and things can blow up on you. And I was a little scared. I mean, honestly, change is bad sometimes. When Rich, when Richie left, I'm like, oh no, not Richie, because Richie's Richie's a guy that Tony leans on all the time. It's worked out, but you know, uh, that's because again, it's because of what Tony's built is is something that is is kind of like a machine. It just repeats itself, and um, so you know, I'll give us credit for hiring Tony Bennett, but I still think Northwestern could have found him before us. Because I, I think that Tony would have had success at a place like Wisconsin, a place like Northwestern, a place like Stanford, you know, pl- places with good academic reputations where they don't want to have the one-and-done kids on campus. Um, we got to him first. Let's just put it that way. We got to the good guy first. He's ours now, and uh, the rest is history. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll kind of put it there because that's where I'll stop with the luck thing. We got to him first, and thank God we did. Absolutely, um, and we hope to keep him. We <laughs> hope that the glory days become the glory years, become the glory decades. That's right. That's right. And and, uh, and, and, it's, and it all built on, on the foundation that he's like that he built, and uh, and it looks like it's a pretty sturdy foundation. And you know, you you bring that up because you know. I'll go back to the angst that we all had. Back to you, Scott, and your angst when Ralph was around. Um, the only angst we have now is that, yes, something happens and Tony decides to go somewhere else. Now, he's not going to go for another college job. There, There's talk every spring towards the end of a season about, well, what about an NBA? What if an NBA team came to try to lure Tony away? And... That's the only thing, and you know, I, I know when Scott and I drive around uh, two games after games coming back home, you know, we'll we'll go over the pros and cons of why that may or may never happen. But the only thing I'll throw in Scott about that is, okay, yeah, I don't think it ever happens because I don't know that Tony and we agree, we've agreed on this a hundred times, but it's it's probably worth having the discussion again because you know what Tony does in terms of his coaching style. It's hard to imagine multi-millionaire NBA players buying into playing defense the way he wants guys to play defense, playing offense the way he wants them to play offense. And if Tony can't coach basketball the way he's coached to this point, what's what's why would you even want to go to the NBA? But that said, you know, Coach K two different times, uh, according to reports, including one time that was very public, uh, almost left Duke for the L.A. Lakers. Um you know, there is a lure. I mean, there is a chance that, you know, some somebody might call at the right moment and, and you know, make the right pitch. Who knows? So, um, 
but that said, you know, you know my, I, I think, you know, I, I don't want to rain on our parade, but heck, we wouldn't be true UVA fans if we didn't see some gray clouds in the sky, right? Right, right. Maybe way off on the western horizon over the Allegheny Mountains somewhere, but darn, we can look hard, if we look hard enough, we can find that gray cloud. That's right. And it's hard to see right now, but it's, but it's, but if we look hard enough, there is that gray cloud. And the gray cloud that I see is when Tony came here, his, his two children were maybe eight and ten. I think so. Uh-huh. Uh huh. They've now they've now grown through their teenage years. Uh, they're both probably now close to being uh, upper high school kids, um, and close to being college age kids uh, that at that age of their life that's what they do they leave the nest and they they venture out uh, it may not be as hard to convince his family that he needs the scenery change um, um, his kids are going to be on their own they're going to be off in college somewhere uh, who knows maybe at UVA maybe somewhere else uh, they're not going to have the emotional attachment to their friends that they that they have had now or have have had the last couple of years. Um, the money's going to be there. It's going to be bigger than what UVA could possibly pay, uh, especially if it's a light franchise. Um, and it's that intangible that that these coaches have at this level, and it's that challenge. Mm -hmm. It's the, mm -hmm. the challenge that I don't have that. Uh, you know, when I see a big enough challenge, I sometimes want to just say, oh, well, you know, I'll tackle something a little less imposing. But uh, someone of Tony's nature, yeah, I could see it. Uh, just to prove to the naysayers, yeah, you know what? The NBA does play defense. They, the, a lot of the NBA plays excellent defense. And, and Tony's offense is not. I mean, we've said it over and over. It's a very efficient offense. Uh, they're one of the most efficient teams in the country offensively. Not one of the highest scoring teams, there's a, big, there's a big difference. If he can take that, parlay that into the NBA, with NBA type players, skill levels, who knows what Tony could have in the NBA. So to say he would never go to the NBA, no, I don't think that, that would be, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to bet my house on that. I, I don't think he will in the next couple of years, but, we talked about how young Tony is. Only 50, not quite 50. 54, 55 year old would be a heck of a coaching uh, prospect to have in the NBA, and there'd be a lot of money if he continues to have the success. He would have the same type of money Wade that he that success he had Wade to him when he when the Lakers were trying to Lakers and I believe the Celtics or the Nets, oh, yeah, the, yeah. the New Jersey Nets, now Brooklyn. So. You know, there's that great cloud out there somewhere, and that that's the, to me that's the only threat that we have right now is that Tony would leave for an NBA job. Yeah, the uh, you know Tony's 48 years old; he'll be 49 June the first. Uh, and um, you know, and when I think of if I'm an NBA owner, NBA general manager, president of operations, whatever I may be, you know, it wouldn't be if I was the 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 uh, the guy heading up, say, I mean, obviously the Golden State Warriors or a team like the Cleveland Cavaliers with a talent like LeBron James. Those kind of teams can kind of roll the ball on the floor and play the way they do. But if I'm the coach of like, I mean, the Boston Celtics with Brad Stevens, a great example. Brad Stevens, the former coach of Butler, who got the job at Boston, and when that happened, when he made that jump, you know, a lot of folks scratched their heads as if. If Tony would take a similar kind of job. Why is he leaving Butler for for Boston? You know, what's the? He's, he's not going to succeed because he's a young coach in college, much less uh, you know whatever else. But you know, if if you're the owner of owner or GM or or president of operations of a franchise that can't land that marquee talent, if you can't land a LeBron James type player, if you can't have a KD or a Steph Curry on your roster, but you can collect a few good players, and you can build a system. That's what Tony's done at Virginia. It's not. It's not based on one player. It's based on a system, a culture. And so, if I was, say, the GM of the Indiana Pacers, or if I was a GM of the Milwaukee Bucks, you know, one of those teams that can never really land again, you know, that top free agent to build your team around, but we wanted to build around a coach. 
Tony Bennett would be – there'd be worse choices certainly than Tony Bennett. And you're right, Scott, about that challenge part. You know, he's a guy who played in the NBA. He knows what it takes to get there. Um, and he would come in instantly with credibility. Hey, I went to Virginia and won for all these years. So, yeah, we would not be Virginia people, admittedly, Scott, and, and those still listening to this. We would not be Virginia people if we did not have that fear that it could all burst – on us at any moment because that's just what defines us. But um, that said, you know, Tony Bennett's 48 years old. Let's just, let's just, you know, 20 years from now, you know, hopefully one, we're still live and kicking to, and, and enjoying all this. But I mean, if, if Tony stays in 20 years from now, uh, you know, he's 30 years into a career. He, he's at the stage at that point where coach K is now, where Coach Dean Smith was at that's you know that 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 point in his life, um, you know I don't know uh, I, I don't I'm not even sure Scott as much as we've had recent success if I can plot that out because 20 years of being Duke 20 years of being North Carolina I mean you know I don't know I mean that that, that I, I I I don't know if I can imagine what that would feel like because I'm still I'm still getting used to where we are right now. No, we're, and we're, I think you're exactly right because we're, we started this podcast off talking about the glory days of Virginia basketball being upon it. And now we're at the end or near the end of it talking about, oh, what are we going to do when Coach Bennett leaves? So we kind of run the full spectrum here. The other one thing you didn't get there, again, again, looking at that gray cloud out there that inevitably we're going to see, the, the NBA also offers Tony an opportunity if he wants it. And if I were an owner, I would certainly wave that carrot out there. And from what I understand, it's what Stevens has at Boston uh, once Danny Ainge steps down is that, that caveat of being the general manager as well. Uh-huh. So uh, Tony would, if he tires of coaching, he can also, you know, that's another option. Uh, again, we're just painting all these ugly scenarios, but I'm, <laughs> I'm just trying to say that you can't, you can't turn your head and pretend that he's ours forever. There are factors out there that we got to consider, and uh, we hope that they don't, that we're not looking at them anytime soon. But, uh, you know, we'd be very foolish to, to think that he's going to be in Charlottesville for the next 25 years. Yeah, because because we're biased. I mean, we watch Virginia every game, and we've done so for 30-plus years, and we've seen every every one of Tony Bennett's games the last nine-plus years. Um, and, and as a result, I mean, you know, we, we definitely – we and, and the listeners out there, I mean, we think of Tony Bennett as the best coach in America, and not just because he's our guy, but because we see – what he does uh, he's not a roll the ball out there and let him play kind of coach he's a, a a system guy uh and the system is a difficult system for guys to pick up i mean look at jay huff jay huff's a four-star recruit that nba scouts covet he can't get on the floor because he hasn't picked up the defense yet so I man tell and, and, and deandre hunter who right now looks like an nba player right now uh he had a red shirt last year because he couldn't pick the system up so i mean it's a difficult system to pick up we know that once the guys pick it up, they're really good at it, and that's why the success is what it is. But, you know, he, he, he is clearly, one of, if not the best coach, he's one of the, on the short list of four or five best coaches in America. And, uh, yeah, that means you're probably going to be in demand. So um, that's a good thing. It's also something that, yeah, it's, you know, it's not quite like in the Ralph years. Ralph was going to play – at most, four years in Charlottesville. This is a great way to kind of wrap things up. Ralph was going to play at most four years in Charlottesville. Your time was limited. You had to win a championship in those four years. Tony's time isn't limited in that respect. His, his time is limited by, you know, whatever else may come about. But, but uh, you know, I guess that's the good thing right now is that uh, we're five years into this fun run, and, and who knows, it may not end. Uh, and even if it does, I guess we've had – We've had it again. I, I, I didn't think in 2006, I said this earlier in the podcast, I didn't think in 2006 when I sat down to co-write that book about the history of UVA basketball to that point, I didn't think it would ever come back. So if nothing else, you know, we, we have what we have now and what we've had the last few years. And uh, 
you know, to have something you didn't think you'd ever have again is pretty cool. It is. So, so we, we went from, you know, euphoria at the very beginning to doom and gloom at the end, near the end. So, uh, maybe I can just end it on a, on a high note again that says that we're number two in the nation. <laughs> we got a game that we should win Saturday or Sunday night. I'm not, I mean, can't put a W down before it happens, but I mean, we should be favorites. Uh, we're one Villanova hiccup away from being number one in the nation. So that's pretty rarefied air. And let's, let's just, uh, kind of ended on that that uh we're knocking on that door to getting back to being number one in the nation again and and also we can knock on this door um uh you, you know i remember the t-shirts when i was a, a student at uva the, the they sold t-shirts at mincers they may still sell them as far as i know i haven't been to mincers in a while uh it had three logos on the t-shirt uh the virginia logo beside it it said the good uh beside the carolina logo it said the bad and beside the Virginia Tech logo, it said the ugly. Um, we're number two, and uh, they were ranked preseason ahead of us, and uh, they're number nothing. So they're, let's, let's, that's a very positive note for our fans to end on. Uh, uh, we've we've got. I don't think we can end on any higher note than that. <laughs> they're number nothing. They're number nothing. <laughs> I love it. They're number nothing. So this has been a. And their, champ- and their trophy case is still collecting nothing but dust and termites. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they don't even have a, 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 a NCAA Yahtzee championship to showcase for the visitors there. So on that note, yeah, this has been fun. I, it, Scott's, Scott gets the credit for booking this show this way. He, he texted me earlier today and said, let's talk something off off topic. Let's talk about where we are as a, as a program. So this has been fun. Um so for Scott German, I'm Chris Graham, of course, now getting back to the nuts and bolts. Yeah, we'll have a preview of, of UVA Wake Forest. We'll we'll have a live blog during the game, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, yeah, this, is, this has been fun. So I want to thank Scott for the idea, and thank you for listening. And we're going to sign off uh, for uh, Street Knowledge. I want to wish everyone a great day.